the Honorable John Charles Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to the president of our university, to the members of the Board of Visitors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this program of unity, togetherness, and understanding. We are one year away from events that brought hurt and harm to our community. Our hope is that this morning will be a time of reflection, remembrance, and dedication to the values and actions needed from all of us to address the many challenges that face our community. We hope too that this gathering will be a meaningful part of the healing process that we need and that, and that what we do here this morning will lead to serious engagement and the exchange of viewpoints in the days and months to come. In short, we hope that this program will be a beginning, not the end. We have a full house here today, and thus we need to call on each of you to be courteous to your neighbors, to be restrained in your use of cell phones and other devices so as not to block anyone's view. And since we will, are streaming live to the broader community, we want to be sure to avoid any disruptions that might hamper that effort. We have ushers and security in the auditorium to assist anyone who might need it. And so in the spirit of togetherness, let us begin. As our program begins, we acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional land of the Monacan Indian people. We invite you to reflect for a moment on our presence in this space, paying respect to the Monacan Indian Nation who are the custodians of this region and contemplating the ongoing struggle for indigenous rights in our communities. And now, the Honorable John Charles Thomas. My friends, we gather here today because we are sure that light will conquer darkness that understanding is more curative than bigotry, that love is stronger than hate, that hope will lead us to a better day. For without hope, we wander in the darkness gripped by fear and anger. Without hope, we lose our determination to build a joyful future. But with hope, we are inspired to embrace our differences. And with hope, we are motivated to uplift humanity. Through hope, we can climb mountains of despair. By hope, we can light the way for others. Thus, hope gives us the courage to stand up against evil. And so it is that we join together this morning to contemplate the hope that summons us. Let us reflect together. We remember those who lost their lives on August 12th, 2017. I shall call their names. Heather Heyer. Lieutenant H. J. Cullen. and Trooper Burke M. M. Bates. And we recall as well the members of our university and Charlottesville community who were injured physically or emotionally on that day and on August 11th. We reflect on the kindness and the compassion shown by friends, neighbors, and strangers to those who were in danger and threatened by violence. 
We also acknowledge the long arc of our history and those in our community who lost their lives or struggled under the burdens of injustice. We remember them and those who joined them on the long march for equality and freedom. And finally, we reflect on our own actions, what we have done and what we must do in the months and years ahead. Now let us pause to remember, to honor, and to reflect during a minute of silence across the grounds, the carillon bells will toll for those we remember today and always. And now the members of the Oratorial Society of UVA, UVA University Singers, and the Zion Union Baptist Church Adult Choir of Charlottesville will sing, Give Me Your Tired, Your Poor.
Our community is enriched by our diversity, and we are mutually strengthened when we reach across physical, cultural, and linguistic differences to embrace the essential values that unite us. Please consider the words of our community members from around the world. Gedulata shel kehila nimdedet al yede ha peulot ha rechamot shel chavarea. Buzurgi yak jamea bawasate faul yat hai mehrabona azai hamon jamea basurate deres masabami shawat. La grandeza de una comunidad se mide con mayor precisión mediante las acciones compasivas de sus integrantes. Todumala no kaji temogo bora o konesiti mutukase. समुदाय को सही मूल्यांकन महानता को सही मूल्यांकन इनका सदस्य और को उधार कार्य बात नहीं होना चाहिए। कोलिको ए वैली का यह नज़ायद नीचा नाई बोले पोकाज़ू देला मिलो सर्जा नियनिक चलानोवा عظمة مجتمع ما تقاس بدقة أكثر من خلال أعمال أفراده العظيفة. The greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. Quote by Coretta Scott King. Brent Davis, John Kanu, and Sophie Park will play Prelude by Dmitry Shostakovich, arranged by Brent Davis.
And now, Valencia Robin will read her work. This poem is not about Facebook. The poem that I'm about to read came out of a prompt given by a visiting poet here at UVA back in 2016. Poets are notorious for giving prompts about things that don't seem, at first glance, very poetic. The prompt was to write a poem with the word Facebook in the title. Of course, this was before we learned about Facebook's unfortunate involvement in the 2016 election. Initially, I couldn't find my way into the poem, but then I went to the 2017 Women's March in Washington, D.C. So this poem was inspired by all the hope that I felt that day and the weeks that followed. This poem is not about Facebook or me posing in front of the ocean with my girls from undergrad in our royal blue dresses, none of my other friends imagining me in a sorority, surprised at how large I am, my contradictions. Oh, and oh cousins I haven't seen in years, oh poets like family, Oh, friend of a friend, wishing your peaches a happy birthday, praising Jesus, praying for the Green Bay Packers. I scroll down you. I look for the end of the page. I voyage through this vast, mixed up, overflowing, puffed up, brilliant, confused, too happy nation. All the streets, mountains, weddings, and camel rides, and all you can eat buffet. It's 50 degrees in January in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm wondering why we're not afraid. Why some people can walk on the moon and never leave home, while others are born waving the wrong flag. I'm staring at a day without car bombs, without a father putting his child back together like a jigsaw puzzle, yet I see my black skin and those blue dresses against the Atlantic and I make the connection, I remember what I should never forget. O kin of everything packed inside this fat shiny now, this morning I sit in a noisy cafe where there are no whites only signs, where young sisters of every kind of fabulous are studying to be what their mothers couldn't. I touch a line of blue text, and without so much as an abracadabra, I watch millions marching like it's 1963. None of it magic. Thank you. And now, Adagio for Strings by Samuel Barber and arranged by Brent Davis.
It is my great honor to introduce the ninth president of the University of Virginia, James E. Ryan, who took office on August 1. He is a scholar of constitutional law and a specialist in the laws concerning education in America. He is a summa cum laude graduate of Yale undergraduate. He took his law degree from the University of Virginia in 1992, where he was number one in his class. He clerked at the U.S. Supreme Court for Chief Justice Rehnquist. Prior to coming here, he was dean of Harvard's Graduate School of Education. But prior to that, he was here at UVA as a law professor, where he spent 15 years as part of this community. And he loves this community. He cares deeply about how we live together, work together, and abide together. We are proud to have him as our president. Ladies and gentlemen, President Ryan. Thank you, Judge Thomas. Good morning. It's an honor to be here with all of you today, which is the one-year anniversary of the march on UVA in Charlottesville, and much less importantly, the 11th day of my presidency. I'd like to start by recognizing those who lost their lives one year ago. Heather Heyer, Trooper Pilot Peter Burke Bates, and Lieutenant Pilot Jay Cullen. Our hearts are with their families and everyone who knew them. I would like to especially acknowledge Heather's mother, Susan, who is with us today. I'd also like to thank all of those who worked so hard to put together this event, as well as those who have participated in it. And thanks, finally, to all of you for being here. It's important that you're here. It's important that we're here together. I'd like to talk to you this morning a little bit about aspirations and realities. We can't turn back the clock and undo the tragedies that occurred last year, nor can we take away the pain, both physical and psychological, of those injured by the neo-Nazis and white supremacists who marched our grounds and who attacked members of our community, both here and downtown. We can apologize, which I will get to, but we can't undo. I wasn't here last year. I watched it in horror from afar and in real time online. But that's different from being here. And I would be the first to acknowledge that what happened was experienced differently by many in the community. It was different for those who were on the lawn and around the statue. It was different for people of color. It was different for those of the Jewish faith. It was different for those who were young and shocked and for those who were older and less surprised, perhaps feeling, in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was not personally attacked for a host of reasons, distance, race, and religion among them. So I offer these thoughts with deep humility and in the spirit of an ally. I cannot truly know the pain of others, but I can recognize it and stand with them in sorrow and in support. And that's why I'm here today. Indeed, it's a big part of why I agreed several weeks after the march to become the next president of this university. Despite its flaws, which are not unique to this place, I love this university and I love Charlottesville. Having lived here for 15 years and having raised our kids here with my wife, Katie, I felt compelled and still do to stand as an ally with those who were attacked, with those who still suffer, and with all of you who long for a better and more just future. As for that future, I believe that in the face of tragedy, having endured some myself, that we can still find the strength to move forward, that we must. William Wordsworth wrote a poem over 200 years ago in which he got it, if I dare say so, almost right. He wrote, Though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, but find strength in what remains behind. It's almost right, because I think we can and should grieve for the fact that nothing can bring back the splendor and the glory of those whose lives were lost 
last August. But we can still, despite our grief, find strength in what remains behind. And we can still have hope, which is what summons us here this morning. When the neo-Nazis and white supremacists marched towards the Jefferson statue last year, they were met by a group of intrepid individuals who had gathered around the statue. It was a remarkable moment of courage and bravery by our students and community members who stood fast and found themselves, perhaps to their surprise, in a position of appearing to defend the Thomas Jefferson statue from attack. I doubt very much that all those who, for, who were forced into that position were intending to defend the statute itself, and I'm certain they were and are fully aware of Jefferson's complicated legacy. Author of the Declaration of Independence, which proclaimed the inherent equality of all, yet also a slave owner. And yet these students and community members were forced in appearing, into appearing to keep the statue safe from the white supremacists who had marched through our grounds intent on causing terror and seemingly intent on laying claim to Jefferson the slave owner as opposed to Jefferson the idealist. This clash around the Jefferson statue, which was all too real to those attacked, also symbolized the ongoing struggle between our aspirations and our realities. Professor Annette Gordon-Reed described this well. She's an eminent Jefferson scholar whose research helped convince historians and others about the relationship between Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Last year, she had this to say. American ideals have always clashed with harsh American realities. We saw that clash on the grounds of UVA. But how do we continue in the face of depressing realities to allow ourselves to hold fast to the importance of having aspirations and recognize that the pursuit of high ideals, even if carried out imperfectly, offers the only real chance of bringing forth good in the world. In many ways, grappling with that question is what being a scholar of Jefferson is all about, perhaps coming fully to grips with the paradoxes that Jefferson's life presents is what being an American is about. This, to me, is one of the most profound observations of what took place last year on our grounds and in Charlottesville. Our professed and cherished, cherished ideals as a community were confronted with the grim and horrific reminder that everyday realities are sometimes quite different. And to wrestle with that difference, to come to grips with the gaps that still exist between our aspirations and our everyday realities is indeed what being an American is about. It is also, importantly, what being a member of this community is about, or should be. We aspire, rightly so, to be a university committed to living the values of diversity, of tolerance, of civility, of equity and inclusion. These are our high ideals. And over time, we've come closer to realizing them. The university today is a much different place than it was 200 years ago. It's a much different place than it was 65 years ago when black students were excluded, or 50 years ago when women were excluded. And to my eyes, it's a different place than it was even five years ago when I was last here as a faculty member. And we are a university that should be proud to have graduated innumerable alumni who have dedicated their lives to advancing our values and to advancing racial, social, and economic justice, like Judge Thomas himself, or like his friend and fellow alum, Elaine Jones, former head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, or like Lee Ward Sears, Donald McEachin, John F. Merchant, Gregory Swanson, Robert Kennedy, Alice Jackson, Walter Ridley, Wesley Harris, Clarence Kane, and Dr. Vivian Pinn, to name just a few. There has undoubtedly been progress, which should be celebrated. But this is also the university we should acknowledge if we have the courage to be candid and open to self-examination that graduated two of the organizers of last year's hateful march. To be a part of this community, to be an honest and courageous member of this community, we have to recognize that there is still a gap between our aspirations and our realities. Faced with this gap, we have three choices. We can reject those aspirations altogether as the marchers through our grounds would do. We can aspire to a better world, but condemn imperfections in those who might otherwise be our allies, which is sadly all too often the case today. Or we can, with generosity of spirit, recognize, as Professor Gordon Reed put it, that the pursuit of high ideals, even if carried out imperfectly, 
offers the only real chance of bringing forth good in the world. I'm here because I choose the third path. I believe with every fiber of my being that the pursuit of high ideals, even if carried out imperfectly, is our only chance. And I believe that is what universities, and ours in particular, should be all about. To follow this path, we have to recognize that those who are allies, who share our aspirations, are like family. Just like family members, we aren't always going to like each other. And we're going to get annoyed, exasperated, hurt, and disappointed by and with each other. Or maybe that's just my family. <laughs> <laughs> but like family, we are bound together. We may disagree about strategy, but we should recognize that we are on the same side. And we are not on the side of white supremacists or neo-Nazis. That part, at least, should be easy. The harder and more important part is seeking together to close the space between aspirations and reality. How, in other words, do we live our values? We say we believe in equity, in diversity, in tolerance, and in inclusion. And I believe those who espouse those values are sincere. And I know that so many of you have been working tirelessly to bring those values to life. Yet we know that there remains a gap between those espoused values and everyday reality here at this university, as is true on campuses around the country, as is true in the world. And the question remains, how do we close that gap? As I listened into conversations this past year, this is the dominant question I heard asked around grounds. How do we close the gap? How do we live our values? This is a question asked by the Dean's Working Group, which led them to propose and ultimately secure funding that will help us increase student and faculty diversity and to create programs that will encourage members of our community to cross lines of difference to find points in common. This question of how we live our values is also the question that has opened up newly vibrant and honest conversations about the university's past and conversations about the university's relationship with the surrounding communities of Charlottesville and Albemarle County. And this is all to the good. And it is quite different, markedly, drastically different from the motives of those who marched last year. Let's be clear. This group of marchers represented an extreme group of lost souls who want to reject our values and aspirations. And they were emboldened, let's be honest yet again, by a political climate that fosters the idea that those fundamental values might actually be up for grabs. Such a different message, if you think about it, from the one delivered by the great Abraham Lincoln, who famously appealed to the better angels of our nature in an effort to bring the country together and to save the Union. To summon hope today is to summon those better angels of our nature who can help lead us down the path to the place where our aspirations and our realities meet. As a university, this means we must have the courage to acknowledge the gaps that still exist. It means we must admit to mistakes, including those made last year, understanding and trusting that others understand that mistakes in times of crises are inevitable, some avoidable, some not. It means pledging to do our best to learn from our mistakes because that is the best that any human or any institution, which is nothing more than a collection of humans, can do. And it means not being afraid to apologize for mistakes we have made. We do nothing more than recognize our common humanity to say to those who were attacked around the statute last year, I am sorry, we are sorry. Beyond this, we must be a good neighbor to Charlottesville and the surrounding counties, which are also home to our employees who are the lifeblood of this university. We must treat our students, faculty, and staff with care, with respect, and with dignity. We must seek ways to serve others and to make the world a better place through our teaching, our research, our medical care, and our partnerships. We must also seek, despite our righteous anger, to understand those who came last year in hatred, and to do so in the spirit suggested by Nelson Mandela, who observed that people are not born with hatred in their hearts, but instead must be taught to hate. Just like any large and somewhat raucous family, we will certainly disagree and argue about the best ways to live our values. 
But this should be an argument in good faith, undergirded by a sense of trust and love. Functional families argue all the time, or at least that's what I tell myself. But they know in their bones that they are connected by an unbreakable bond of love, trust, and respect. And they give each other the benefit of the doubt, knowing that they are and always will be in this together. To the family that is UVA and the surrounding communities, I will end by highlighting this basic and simple fact. We are in this together. My deepest hope is that in the months and years ahead, we will truly feel like we are in this together and that we will feel like our fates are connected, that we will feel, as Dr. King observed, that we are bound together in a single garment of destiny. I stand here today as an ally. I am surely an imperfect one, which is to say I am human, like all of you. I will disappoint some of you for doing too much, others for doing too little, some for going too fast, others for not going fast enough. But I know in my heart where I would like to go, and that is the place where our aspirations and our realities finally intersect. I know that many of you, so many of you, would like to get there as well. And I look forward to our imperfect journey together. Thank you. After our final song, we look forward to joining you for our communal breakfast, which will begin at 10 a.m. Breakfast sites are across the lawn, and so I ask that you please refer to the map that was distributed when you entered the auditorium. There will also be staff there to direct you to the location printed on your ticket under the word type. Now, before we go, let's please rise and sing, lift every voice and sing.